Now we barely 24 hours to the presentation of the much anticipated budget that will announce an IMF program tonight will ask. Will it contain the economic policies that will rescue Ghana's alien economy? The budget, we understand, is expected to inspire hope, restore macroeconomic stability, uh, bolster resilience, and achieve inclusive growth, and also ensure value addition to the country's raw materials in order to rake in more revenue and the much needed foreign exchange to contain the current economic challenges. But is this also going to signal tough times? As you are hearing, the possibility of the introduction of a raft of taxes, including an increase in the value added tax, VAT. Well, former finance minister, Sector Pe, director of uh, ISE, Professor Peter Corte, and political risk analyst, Dr. Theo Echampo, will be joining me soon. But first, I would like to hear from the groups who have submitted demands during the budget hearing. For example, the Ghana Union of Trades, uh, Traders Association uh, have also submitted some other uh, demands they think should be included in this budget. We'll be speaking to the health sector workers unions later on. But Dr. Joseph Abin is with the Guta. He joins us now via Zoom. Doc, you're welcome to our front. Thank you so very much. I hope you are doing well this evening. Yes, I am, sir. And certainly, the grace, grace I, I, of God. I understand the former finance minister, Sector Pe, has also joined us. And Dr. Theo Champon is joined us from his base in the United Kingdom. I, th yes, that's what we were told previous. Okay, yes, that's what we're supposed to be knowing. And also, Sector Pe is in the USA now. Gentlemen, you're also welcome to our front. Hello, hi. Let me start with you, um, Dr. Uh, thank Obey. you very much. As we speak, if you can hear me, Dr. Joseph Obey, I know you as Guta submitted some proposals for consideration and inculcation into this particular um, budget. Let me understand what these uh, major policies you want changed, reversed or improved are and what your general expectations are. Yeah, uh, generally the three pillars upon which businesses thrive have all broken down. These are the inflation, SM rates, and interest rate. So we don't have standing as businesses. And so we are expecting that um, government or the finance minister articulates a policy direction uh, to stabilize the um, SM rate, the depreciation, and then also be able to reduce the monetary policy rate. And then um, a fast means to bring down uh, the inflation. We've said that inflation is as a result of accumulation of costs and nothing else. It's not that uh, more money is chasing fewer goods that they normally say. It's because we pay more duties that uh, the exchange rate has also made it very expensive um, um, for our products to go high and that the VAT that was 3%, that went up to 19.25, the standard rate. The cumulative, cumulatively, it went up to 19.25. All these things, factors, including the increase in uh, the, the lending rates, that have gone to about 40%. The accumulation of this have made prices of goods um, uh, sought up in the market, and then also making it a very... Um, unbearable for the trading um, community. So we are expecting that uh, the finance minister articulate clear policies and then timelines that to, uh, to deal with this. We have to know the timelines and then the roadmap um, so that we all will know that this is what um, we are expecting at this stage, at any stage of our, our life at this time. Mm. Then um, the VAT, as we are all talking about now, that they want to increase. Um, we, are, we are not uh, uh, expecting another layer of cost of doing business. It will not be fair. Businesses are already overburdened. <coughs> we are so much overburdened to the extent that if they increase um, another tax, uh, they introduce another tax or even in, uh, increase uh, uh, existing one, you're going to break the back of uh, businesses. Um, already, we have said that there's ununiformity of the VAT system. The VAT system, as it's structured now, um, does not um, bring fairness or parity in the market. And that we seek 
um, uniformity in the tax administration. That in the one market, we have three uh, VAT systems running concurrently with, with, with one another. And if you have not even done that, then you don't have even to increase it in the first place. We have said that in the market, we have the VAT of um, the standard rate uh, that accumulates to about 19.25. Then we have the flat rate of 4%. And yet we have um, those who do not um, pay um, this VAT at all. And there's no compulsion on the part of the consuming public to take or to receive uh, VAT invoices. In that case, those of us who have registered or complying with the tax rules are being unnecessarily uh, uh, punished or victimized. And so if you have not done all these things, we do, uh, no, uh, no one has the right to even increase it to aggravate the, uh, uh, already the problem that we have. Duty prices have gone up astronomically high. Duties that we're paying about 50,000 have gone up to about 300,000. Okay. Because of the effects of the exchange rate and because of the increase of the benchmark value, which is uh, being perpetrated on us uh, illegitimately. There's no valuation system in the world called benchmark value system. The WTO frowns on the benchmark um, 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 system. And uh, there's nothing known like that. The benchmark is only a set tool by the customs to, um, if they want to know the real value of your, your goods, to also verify that um, this is a correct value that you are paying. But you do not use as a first point of use um, to, um, to build any importer, and that um, um, uh, is not fair to us. And these are the reasons why um, duty payments have gone up astronomically high. You've listed. So, uh, Doc, we yeah. are not the Yes, you've listed about six very different issues. If I actually tabulated them right, right for macroeconomic issues, straight down to what's going to be maybe one of the top highlights of the budgets coming in, that's a possible increase in the value added tax plus other possible uh, taxes that will be introduced in this upcoming budget. Already you are signaling that you will not be excited by an increase in tax. I'm so sure that nobody really is excited by a VAT increase at all levels across all countries. But government had insisted this is the best way to go if you want to be back on our feet, that we need to bite the bullet for brighter times going into the future. Aren't you willing to sacrifice a little bit for the collective good of the country? Unfortunately, they are getting it wrong. Because um, when taxes are overpriced or are overcharged, compliance is very low. When taxes are affordable, compliance is very high, and you get your pay as a government. This is what they don't know. And that if you want to ensure compliance, and if you want to maximize on your uh, revenue collection, what you have to do is to make it affordable and simplified. That's what effective tax administration is and not mm. to go on compiling and make it extremely difficult for people um, to pay. What mm. government can do if they want money is to plug up the, uh, the leakages. And we have so many areas like the free zones, which is being abused by the warehousing system, which is being abused by the, um, uh, uh, the tax exemption uh, policy, which is being abused. And all these areas are the area that the people who are there are the uh, people who are capable of paying taxes. But these are the areas that the abuse is so high and we do not look at those places. And that tax should not be recycled around just a few of us. And that the tax needs to be expanded. We have to expand the tax net and make it very um, uh, affordable for everybody um, to play it bit. And not that just a few, around about 6 million people paying the taxes for about 30 million people. Effectively, about around 1.2 million people are effectively paying these taxes. And that is not fair for us, and that we always come, especially the importing community, to lump up everything on us, and, uh, and then our backs are 
uh, be broken. Now, let me quickly find what you will do if government continues uh, to actually implement this possible increase in VAT. If government goes ahead, you in business, what can you do differently? You see, um, you cannot pretend to have um, um, a program that um, you are expecting a resource. And so when you bring it and the people cannot afford it, simply they dodge it. And that's why um, and, and sometimes they say they are sending the, uh, the task officials for investigation and all that, and that will prompt um, demonstration. The one in Kumasi was as a result of the same thing. You understand? And so uh, if you, you, that's why you have to listen to, uh, to stakeholders also. If you have a genuine problem, that there's no uh, parity in the tax administration, the structure uh, does not ensure uniformity, and you do not address <coughs> it. It means that you are not listening to the sentiments of the people, mm. and that will not be fair if you have not addressed the pertinent issues, and then you go ahead to increase uh, uh, the VAT itself. Then it will not be fair. I don't know the details. If the details is such that they have addressed all our, our problems, um, and then we come to the increment of the tax also. Now, we sure should be able to uh, engage on this particular issue further. Let me bring in the other guest. Um, Mr. Tekpe, for every finance minister, especially on the very night you announce the very anticipated budget, which is supposed to tell us that we, are, we have an IMF program in the offing and this is how we are going to go about it, that same budget should also signal a lot of interest in doing things, according to this government, which will bring back the economy on its feet. Already, people are beginning to protest the possible increase in VAT. How do you think we should go about this? And is it a welcoming news anyway? Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, I think that I can say uh, without any equivocation that this is a budget that has very high expectations. You know, not just from Ghanaians, but as we know, we are going to go into an IMF program, and this is the budget, you know, that would indicate to the IMF, to the World Bank, development partners, those who help with the budget, Ghanaians who also pay, you know, the taxes, um, as well as the markets, you know, those whose bonds we have been contemplating what to do with, uh, including Ghanaians who have invested in particularly treasury bills, you know, and some domestic, you know, bonds. Uh, we do have ratings agencies and others who are watching. And the policy context of this budget must be right to avoid further downgrades and to avoid loss of confidence, you know, in the economy. Of course, what I have mentioned is expectations of all budgets, but we know the situation that in which we are at the moment. A uh, second point I'd like to make is that in fact the scratching of heads uh, within a sub-Saharan sub African context is baffling to many people you meet. And that is because when it comes to sub-Saharan Africa, Ghana is well respected with respect to its policies, with respect to its economic performance. Uh, and that is one other area where we have not been you know, discussing, you know, very much because Ghana is a middle-income country among Africa's emerging middle-income countries. Either there are a few uh, higher-income countries, uh, sorry, high, one is a high-income country, uh, that is the shells. Then we have, you know, collectively maybe about 20 or so that are either upper middle-income or lower middle-income for whom, you know, there is a change in dynamics, in the way we are perceived globally. And I think we discussed this before, but we can, you know, touch on it. Let me also say, you know, that for me, uh, the debate is back on taxes. And we are not talking about expenditure. The difference between revenue and expenditure is a deficit, which leads to borrowing, and which leads to the debt, which is the biggest thing, even the fund is expecting how we are going to manage, you know, debt. If you consider a very common assumption that when you implement a tax policy, 
it takes about two years or so, a comprehensive tax policy to materialize, then you would agree with me that, you know, anything we do without tackling expenditure, which is leading to the deficit and the borrowing and the debt, right, uh, will be grossly misplaced. We are not talking about expenditure, and the hints coming from government is still not talking about expenditure. Perhaps because we want to protect le certain legacy expenditures. In fact, we have calculated that the 30 percent or so by the uh, mid-year, if that was supposed to <laughs> expenditure was supposed to be to be to go down, uh, by mid-year we are done less than one percent of the reduction in expenditure, especially and it's worse if you consider that. The media review actually reduced the revenue projection, which we had all said on the back of E levy was you know too high. So um, I like to cast this in a broader you know perspective. And uh, if we have time, you will permit me. Let me say that the issue of taxes is not big. The personal income tax rates went up to thirty five, down to thirty but they are above the 25%. VAT, the implicit increase in VAT as a result of removing GetFi and uh, NHI and refusing input tax credit. When you refuse input tax credit, it is added. The businessman will add it to cost. It's one of the major causes. It's implicitly first, a VAT increase. And secondly, it is one of the causes of increase in prices contributing you know, to inflation. You know, um, this is uh, quite significant. But in addition to these two levies, we do have actually 14 existing, including ESLA, and new levies on our books. So it seems as though we have, and that's what I, I if we have time, I can, I can share, you know, item by item. All of this is bringing barely 4% of GDP revenue. And therefore, it seems that we would need something more. The distortions that have taken place, including the um, <clears throat> benchmark, including the blocking of input tax credits, including higher uh, tax rates and the rest in position of several levies, is something that we must attend to as part of the revenue system. Mm. The other point I'd like to make about revenue, uh, and then maybe yield the floor for others to come in with their introductory remarks, is the fact that tax administration is getting weaker. It's getting weaker, one, because if you have 14 levels, you are imposing a very high administration cost on GR to monitor 14, you know, taxes, different tax standards, in addition to the ones that are the pillar, and that is the income tax, you know, the, uh, which is personal and corporate income tax, in addition to the VAT, you know, however, you know, uh, distortionary it has become, in addition to excise duty, you know, and then import duty. These are the pillars of our tax system. And these are the ones that continue to yield the most revenue. And if you lump all these levies together, 14 of them, as I said, plus the ESLA, if you break them down, it's about 18 or 19 levies, you know, either retained or new, right? Some which should have gone away by 2020, like the ESLA that we are keeping on the books. It tells you that we have pushed a lot of you know, revenue, which is becoming counterproductive because maybe they are high and there's evasion and avoidance. Mm. We should, you know, we should look at expenditure critically because the gap will not decrease. You know, we have projected that revenue expenditure will increase from about 16% to 20%. That's a first four percentage point increase. We could not even get closer. We were still hovering around the 16%. I and then you. expenditure around 20% gives a gap of about 4%. You know, and has gone down by barely 1% as a result of some measures. And remember, expenditure heat is still on from labor. Expenditure is, heat is on. Some of the, you know, demands that are being made are basically expenditure, but particularly in return to fixed income. Okay. Like wages, mm. you know, which is uh, affecting those on fixed incomes against the background of inflation and higher prices. 
Now, it's interesting the <coughs> dynamics that you have brought to the conversation. Let me come to this conversation. Uh, on the plate that we have, our service worker senior already joining us. And frankly, also on site with the, he's the general secretary actually of the health service worker senior. Mr. Usan Saiyan, welcome to Upfront. Thank you, my brother. Uh, sorry, like I told you, I've been on a journey from Takrade, so permit me if my lighting and my sound is not too good. Well, but, I, I think uh, we, can, we can actually... Let's make progress. progress. Yes. Let me ask you this. Already, there is a bit of a stalemate on the front of labor, which is to do with specifically the negotiations you're making on how much you should be paid. Government is proposing about 15%. Labor is insisting on some 16%. And we have a deadlock as we speak. Tomorrow is budget day. Do you expect that the finance minister will still go ahead and use your 15% in the determination of the very estimates for the budget? Or you make some headway? And if they do, what will happen? Thank you. Uh, in any case, uh, the Financial Management Act Government was supposed to have finished this year's negotiation by April. As we speak, if government have not been able to complete, you don't blame uh, workers, but it is the system that has not uh, helped any of us. But the, as to our expectation, irrespective of the percentage that will be agreed in terms of uh, uh, increases in the labor wages. If certain things in the economy does not change, it will, it, it will still amount to nothing. Today, as we speak, if government is unable to bring out policies in the budget that will stabilize the CD and also other policies to help us also get uh, fuel prices down, in respect, even if government gives 100%, workers will still be suffering. Today, a lot of workers uh, can't go home with their salaries. What I mean by they can't go home is transportation alone is... Well, I, well I, I, Sorry. After teaching, trans, uh, the salaries workers to receive uh, cannot even uh, match their transportation costs to work uh, for the whole month. So irrespective of the percentages that will be given to labor, if nothing is done about the foreign exchange, then uh, it will still amount to nothing. For the fact that organized labor has proposed something higher and then uh, government has also proposed something lower, does not stop anybody from reading the budget because we don't determine what goes into the budget. But we want to believe that government will hear workers and something can be done about it. Yes, today we were at a negotiation table, but we couldn't uh, reach conclusion. We are not at the deadlock yet, but we hope that something can be done. And then uh, from January, we can receive salaries that can take us home, my brother. Yes, and I'm privileged to have had you join this conversation and explain exactly what's happening to workers on the front. But let me bring in that political risk analyst and economist. Dr. Chua we, we, Champon, we, we need money on one hand. On the other side, we need really a lot of ways to rake in the money. They are, some are opposing more taxes, others are demanding more wages. Government appears to be in a fix on what to do to make sure that this economy is seen as credible by outsiders. What should be the thinking around uh, our policy going into tomorrow's delivery? Um, yeah, th thank you very much. I, I think a number of the points really have been echoed by the uh, earlier um, speakers. Um, but fundamentally, um, Tomorrow's budget, in my view, would be one of the most consequential budgets we've ever had as a country, probably in the last couple of uh, years, largely because of the crisis of confidence that people have uh, with this particular uh, economy as a result of the fact that many of the policies that the government has been pursuing over the last um, few months and uh, maybe even years 
have been seen as not being credible. Um, just a few months ago, we had the media budget that was read with a set of budget projections and numbers. And as, as at the time the budget was read, many of those numbers didn't really you know, add, add up in that sense. So for, for many uh, market watcher participants, people are looking forward to seeing to what extent, if any, this budget would address the fundamental ills or challenges with this uh, economy. Um, at the macro level, there are probably three key things that for me I think are important. Measures to address inflation, measures to address or to try from the fiscal side of things to deal with the um, exchange rate. Um, and then on the third dimension, and most importantly, how you're going to deal with the debt issues that we are currently bedeviled with. And that's where the point that um, Uncle said makes is actually very important, that it is not just a question of raising more revenue or even increasing the tax handle such as VAT, but we have a major problem with expenditure. And if we cannot address or control the expenditure side of the equation, including even some of the allocations that we make to, to places like the Office of Government Machinery and some of the sort of um, uh, priority um, initiatives of the government, we will still be at a place or the position where we're still going to have you know, challenges uh, with, with, this, with this economy. So, so that's really from where I said the core thing. Number one, what, you're going, or what the government is going to do to address the debt overhang and the unsustainable debt that we've got. And that takes us back to the issue of expenditure and borrowing. And even within that, I even am expecting some sort of maybe moratorium, right, on even borrowing from the external market. Already the market has punished us, we cannot go. But let's have a clear policy intent or signaling that for the next two, three years, we're not going to go borrow from the external market whilst we fix a, a number of the, the challenges that, that faces us. So the expenditure side of the equation becomes extremely important mm -hmm. in addition to dealing with the current challenges that uh, has to do with inflation and the exchange rate, because that is what many an ordinary citizen feels on the ground uh, as, as, uh, as we speak. I was in Ghana just two, two weeks ago, and you know, um, uh, the, 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 the heat, people are feeling it, um, and the cost of living concerns are real, but the government cannot just increase salaries across the board without adding more to you know, the, the debt situation. But I strongly believe that the solution is not necessarily on the revenue side of the equation. I think we can do a lot more on the expenditure side of the equation. Now, I get you, and there's a question I'll be coming back to, with the exception of Dr. Bain. Let me come to Mr. Tepe and Dr. Champo once again. You have mentioned consistently the expenditure side. We know the chunk of how much we earn go, on, go, go into paying workers on one side, and also on the other side, having to deal with the very, very serious problem of servicing our debt. So interest payments and just clearing the salary we give to workers, remuneration takes up a chunk of, of, of our budget. When you say we should cut back on expenditure, exactly what else do you think we can cut back within this space? We start at first. Well, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> you definitely have to do some squeezing um, uh, because that is what austerity is all about, whether it is homegrown or it is something which if you want the cooperation of uh, multilaterals and development partners will be imposed on you. And I think if we, if we face up to it and let Ghanaians you know, know that expenditure is a, is a problem, then I think it's important it will become, it's not part of the conversation. We have to make it part of the conversation. Now, before I get to maybe a uh, couple of specifics, you see, you mentioned compensation and you mentioned interest. Compensation and interest, by recent calculation, is taking about 107% of, you know, tax, total tax revenue. That means that another critical element in the 
the debate on debt is that we are borrowing to pay the principal on existing debt. And that is where, again, it's important to note the financing by Bank of Ghana comes in. Because if you have a budget, you know, which is supposed to have a deficit of 37 billion, you know, uh, Ghana cities by some estimates is about 40 billion. And Bank of Ghana is financing 22 billion by mid year. By mid year. By mid year, if you do pro rata, the deficit which should be financed is about 15%. The Bank of, Bank of Ghana is already been 22%. Where are we going to end the year? And that is inflationary. That is deficit financing because the reserves have gone down. So if the reserves have gone down, where is Bank of Ghana getting that money from? Both the domestic and external reserves. And that is because Bank of Ghana is falling on our reserves to service debt in order that we should not default. And this is where the exchange rate, you know, and other questions which uh, <coughs> uh, Dr. Champon, you know, raised becomes very, very, you know, uh, important. So I think we should take this issue. And yes, there will be a moratorium on borrowing, whether we impose it ourselves or it is imposed as part of the program. Let me give you a specific example. Coming from the single spine doom store and all that, when we enter the ECF, despite the initiatives that we are taking ourselves before we went into the, we had, you know, again, this is not being discussed, 500 million US dollar annual borrowing, commercial borrowing imposed on us under the ECF program. And it was only when things were relaxed going into 2017 that the government was able to borrow more. If we had to borrow all the bonds that we did, including the one that we used for refinancing, you know, and this is where the question of, you know, whether there will be uh, rebates and others on debt becomes very important. We had to do refinancing on our own. If you remember the 2015 bond, yeah. you had to, if you wanted to borrow beyond the 500, you had to go to the, you know, to get a waiver from the IMF board. And this is a prospect. Now, from what I have said, and let me come back, our expenditure, if our compensation interest, just these items, plus principal repayment is from borrowing, remember our capital is also from borrowing, and the remainder of recurrent goods and services is also from borrowing, arrears, is from is being paid from borrowing. This is the problem that we have. And as we know, there's a government report that shows that pipeline projects as at the end of 2021 amount to 77 billion, out of which 22, 24 billion was paid. So we are sitting on a pipeline of 53 billion. Now, even if we take it that 10% of this is in the pipeline for payments, because pipeline means contracts and other things which may not have been completed or are in the works. Even if you take it that 10% of this, you know, has been brought for payment, that is 5 billion, compared to the 1.9 billion Ghana cities arrears that we have in the budget. And that means these are further adjustments that would have to be made. And if we insist on continuing, and when we talk about expenditure, we're talking about not awarding new contracts. If you remember the moratorium on new contracts, you know, and others, these, these are also part of, you know, expenditure. That is, you tackle the pipeline. And then you have to tackle, as I said, you cannot live with all your uh, legacy, you know, uh, dreams and, and projects. For example, free SHS. And I always say that going into the 2016 election, if you remember, you know, President Mahama announced himself that he was putting some moratorium on the construction of new uh, uh, e-schools, which was a foundation for the progressive fee free because it takes the schools, you know, to the community, yeah. districts, villages, and the rest. So, so uh, there is precedent, mm -hmm. you know, in every program that we have done that you tackle as, you know, expenditure, including subsidy and other things which come in, right? So that conversation is not being had because it is the toughest okay. conversation when it comes to a discussion of IMF programs. I, I have a question for you, uh, Mr. Tekpe, on what the finance ministry should do now about what labor is demanding and what governments want to do and the fight against increasing taxes too and where else we could actually get revenue uh, going up. But let me bring in the director of the Institute for Statistical Social and Economic Research, 
Professor Peter Corte. Prof, you're welcome to Upfront. Well, I'm sure that Prof should be able to join us in a second on, on this particular conversation. But I'm, I'm staying with you. Mute. Yeah, yes, yes. I, 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 okay, well, maybe you ought to unmute, Prof. Yes, if you're able to join, join us in a second, I sure should be able to bring you on board. Now, let me get this clarity from you, Mr. Tekpe, because it's, it's, it's part of the conversation happening. There is demand for better pay as we speak. <clears throat> There is also demand that the macroeconomic situation ought to be improved. And that demand is so categorical from Guta and virtually everybody. In fact, we need to rake in more resources. You're also insisting that we should cut back on our expenditure in very important areas. How can we manage all of these? And if you were a finance minister who is currently having to negotiate base pay, and there's a gap, 15% you are proposing, and 60% is what Labour is also proposing. How would you be able to manage that alongside the other fight against possible tax handles you want to introduce? Well, remember besides Senchi, you know, we had the whole forum, which brought Labour. Before then, we had been having significant discussions, you know, with Labour, particularly single spine, you remember where we agreed that if we were to borrow, continue borrowing to meet the single span, you know, it would break the budget. You know, we had indicated that 70% at the time of tax revenue, not total revenue, was being used to pay, including arrears. At the moment, I'm not sure whether the figures we are talking about include wage arrears. So this is something which, you know, had been done before. You know, you bring it and we brought it to the fore. We agreed with Labour to do three years. If you remember, we also did, you know, a cola with Labour to ease, you know, a bit of the burden uh, with the promise to pay. And we went through all of this, uh, which should be, you know, a lesson and guidance. You know, as the rep from Labour mentioned, these were some of the things that prompted the provision in the uh, Public Financial Management Act that by April, you know, all these negotiations should be done so that when you start, you know, meeting ministries, departments, and others for the budget hearing for May, which sincerely starts from May, you I, would I'm have sorry, had a fair idea. I, I want to drill down to the point, forgive me. I just want to ask you, tomorrow is the day they are presenting the budget. Should they go ahead and inculcate their own proposed figure into the budget for wages they want to increase this year? Should the estimate reflect that? Or they should agree on a certain percentage before they proceed with it. It appears there's a deadlock as we speak. There is a provision in the Public Financial Management Act <clears throat> that where, and I forget the precise wording, pardon me, but where consensus cannot be reached. My recollection is that, you know, the previous year's, uh, you know, agreement should prevail. Um, I stand for correction on that point. But the, I'm, I'm very sure that, I'm very sure about that provision. So there's a condition in there, whether that will satisfy labor, you know, it's one thing, you know, because remember, like, you know, our experience, you know, last year was a, a cola year, and you cannot continue with cola, you know, all the time. But we also know the burden that this will impose, you know, if labor, and probably these are the issues that have been discussed, you know, belatedly, you know, under the Public Financial Management Act. Let uh, it's, it, will take, it will take somebody, even like me, to be bold, because, uh, to do some of these predictions, specifics. Uh, we will have to wait till tomorrow because for a budget that's going to be read tomorrow, definitely the government proposals are in it and we do not want to be speculating at this stage. You know, I, maybe we gather again and discuss so that, you know, the, all the experience you have at the table can be brought to bear to discuss, you know, the government's, you know, uh, policies that, that will be in the budget. I get your point. <clears throat> Let me bring in Professor Peter Kote. Uh, Prof, we are in a very tight corner. Labour is demanding more. On one side, Guta would not want taxes increased. The question about where we'll find money to actually give to Labour is also there. But how do we fix this ahead of tomorrow? How can government ensure two things are done? Suit those who are insisting they should not increase taxes and also suit those who are demanding more pay. Well, well, I think um, this deadlock cannot continue. Government may take the risk of going ahead with 
some percentage, but that will not be the best way forward. Ideally, we have to have a consensus. Otherwise, um, going into 2023, uh, there might be labor agitation, there might be unrest, and you may have to revise the figure. So I think there's still room. Um, that's why the fire is going to be read tomorrow. Um, they can engage maybe early uh, morning or, or have some back of the, you know, behind the scenes discussions. So some meaningful projections will enter into the budget. Is it when we find ourselves is very critical. We have not been able to increase our revenue by 40% or 60% in a year. That has not happened. You know. So if we are asking for wages above a certain threshold, that may lead the country into some kind of a, a crash, if I may put it that way. The government machinery cannot contain that. Our finances cannot contain that. We all agree, uh, we all work in this country, we break our backs for this country, but how much is being proposed is too high. Government cannot afford it. So we need to have a, a win-win situation, some consensus, let's put the interest of the country forward. I expect government to also show goodwill by reducing the size of government, by ensuring that we, we manage the spending. It's not just about revenue. It's also about expenditure. So government should show the good way by reducing the size of government and, and cut on some of the uh, uh, programs, uh, flagship programs, or revise some of them so that we contain whatever expenditure we have in our budget. Let me also add that our revenue GDP, tax revenue GDP, is low by African standards. What do we do? Make the existing taxes more efficient, but also we can also we also consider maybe increasing uh, VAT by some marginal rate, but that should come um, at the back of ensuring efficiency. Uh, given where we find ourselves, given that we are going to a fund program, given that we cannot borrow, continue to borrow, so we certainly have to raise this money from domestic sources. And I can refer you to Price Waterhouse Coopers International. Um, VAT rates, you find some countries below um, Ghana's threshold, you find some far above our threshold. But the key thing is that whatever tax you raise from the people, they want to ensure or they want to be sure that that money is used judiciously. So if you want to increase bar VAT by a marginal, I hear in some, uh, yesterday I heard on your, your uh, or today, some allegations or some assertions of an increase in PAT. Well, we may uh, welcome that, uh, given what I've seen in under the price waterhouse um, VAT rates across Africa and across other countries. However, efficiency is key. Efficiency in tax collection, efficiency in our spending, getting value for money, reducing the size of government, which should go hand in hand with any tax or marginal tax increment. Mm. Now, you brought in the tax part, and I want to stay on that with you, Professor Korte. They are proposing, and we understand that's something that's more likely to be in our budget. Some other taxes, but more importantly, the sharp focus has been on a possible increase in VAT. Is this something you support? Would it be the needed revenue enhancing or generating measure that will spearhead or push this government into the right numbers? Well, I'll, I'll give you where we find ourselves. I will support it on condition, on, on condition that one is going to be a marginal increment, nothing more than 1%. Two, that there is also the assurance that government is going to reduce its size. That, that for me, it should be very critical. Then also, we can also look at other non-tax revenues like uh, property rates, etc., and make them more efficient. We have a lot of taxes in the system already, and we don't want to overburden the consumer or the ordinary Ghanaian. Let's make all those tax, tax handles efficient. And if we want to increase VAT, it has to be a marginal increment. We can also reduce the E-Levy rate. The E-Levy rate currently is punitive and is not helping us raise the needed revenue. Let's revise that. I believe with all of this, given that we cannot go ahead and borrow from the international markets, and even from a domestic market, we are restricted. We should find a way of shoring up our revenue base. And if this is one way to do so, that is fine. But it ought to be efficient. It ought to be 
utilized judiciously and therefore the emphasis should be on a reduction in the size of government and i believe once government shows that goodwill the citizens would then buy into any marginal tax increment or VAT increment now let me bring in Remo, the, Remo, can I the, make a point? Yeah, yes um yes mr tekpa yes uh, Raymond, I, I think we should be realistic when we talk about the VAT rates. Uh, in Ghana, we started a VAT with 10%. We added get fat, 2.5%. We added NHIR, 2.5%. We added the one that goes to give a total of 7.5, which raised our VAT rate to 17.5, which was a reason. It was just tactical moves because remember, the issue with Kumi Preko and others made it difficult to introduce the VAT at a realistic rate of 17.5, where it was pegged before the cancellation of the VAT. I'm going to history. I happen to have been the coordinator, so I know what I'm talking about. Now, what we therefore did was to allow all the VAT concessions, particularly input tax credits and refund for NHIL, for uh, get fund and for give. So we said that all these taxes, the EMO, we call the EMAC fund, in addition to DACF, we did not, we did not include it, you know, were collected as though they were a VAT, and therefore input tax credit was allowed. Now, if you remove get fund and NHI, and you even refuse the input tax credit, you don't come around and say that your VAT rate is 12%. Uh, your VAT rate remains 17.5 with 5% of it because they are on the books. With 5% of, of it being made worse because you are denying the input as credit for business. That is for business transactions. And therefore, business will add it at cost. So the rate remains at 17.5. And in addition, as I said earlier on, I don't want to repeat it, we have 16 levies. 16 levies on our books as of now. How much more? So we need to look at, you know, even the automation of the domestic tax system will make the collection of domestic taxes, you know, more efficient. If you permit me, I was looking for the clause. Let me, for the avoidance of doubt, this is what the PRMA says. Where salary and other compensation negotiations in respect of the public sector are not completed by the end of April, of the current fiscal year, the fiscal strategy document, that is the document which is presented to cabinet, prepared for the ensuing fiscal year, that is what would have been prepared for this year, shall state an expected negotiated, negotiated aggregate of public sector salaries and compensation for the ensuing year based on the negotiated public sector salaries and compensation for the preceding year, that is last year. So whatever cabinet would have approved is what will have to be in the budget. You know, as was inferred, you know, by uh, uh, Prof, you know, and uh, the two props, you know, that we have on the table. I was just looking for the specific provision. So, uh, so if you miss the April, then these are the conditions, you know, for preparing the budget, unless but you want to go against these provisions. I, I, I've not heard you make a categorical statement on this. Do you support increasing VAT now? Categorically, yes or no, and why? I think I've given you enough reasons. You know, uh, particularly if we are going to concede that an increase in the VAT, you know, transparency is important. You know, I'll be opposed to anything that's not transparent. If you are, if you are going to increase the VAT rate and you say that you are increasing from 12%, I'm saying that dropping uh, NHIL and get fund and calling them straight levies when they remain on the books means that effectively, you know, you are increasing 17 and a half percent. You are not increasing 12 and a half percent. You know, because they, they, you only change their, their nomenclature, their description. What you did was to make them worse by refusing businesses to claim input tax credit. It's unfortunate that Dr. Bing is no longer with us. He would have you know, but moreover, you have increased, you have things, I don't want to be well, but belabor this point, you, you, you have now VAT withholding on import, the taxable base for VAT on import is simple, it supplies, whether you are registered or not. 
Now you are withholding taxes, you know, on VAT at import, which is an increase for those who are not registered. You have the VAT flat risk scheme, of course, which used to be, you know, uh, uh, not applied to businesses, small businesses that were on a higher, you know, threshold. There's a lot that has happened to the VAT. And I would urge my professional, you know, and academic colleagues to look at the comprehensiveness of what has happened since 2017 to the VAT before we support any rate increase. <clears throat> so you're opposed to it? Let's wait for the budget. Well, okay. That's an interesting <laughs> point to hear. That. Finally, let me hear your final words. Uh, let me start with Dr. Tiwe Champon. Uh, final expectations ahead of tomorrow. Yeah, so for me on the issue of the VAT, I think uh, it's very clear. I don't support any increment in VAT, just on the basis of the fact that there are other ways to raise money uh, within the system, including cutting back on expenses. Um, uh, um, uh, Uncle Seth has actually explained the rationale, right, for the VAT and the change in the base of the computation when we added the GET fund and the okay. NHIL, more or less back onto the original 12.5%, and now are currently not even allowing some of the deductions on the input on, on that. I don't think that's really what can be done. Actually, you can raise more money even with dropping the e-levy threshold. I think also maybe uh, another handle the we had in the past, the National Fiscal Stabilization Levy, uh, which was introduced in times of crisis, but it was a very targeted tax handle and we could possibly uh, look at that and quickly, on the uh, expenditure side, um, specifics. You know, last year, in the 2022 budget, under the Office of Government Machinery, we budgeted to spend 300 million Ghana CDs on scholarships alone, right? Some of these paying for people to study outside and changing our, you know, small CDs into hard forex. And for 2023, if you look at Appendix 4A of the budget, we're projecting to spend 360 million Ghana cities on scholarship. I think that can be halved, if not any. There are other things within those appendices in the budget where if you dig through, you can actually see ways and means of slashing and cutting and be able to offer or live within your means rather than just seeking to increase, you know, tax fees across the board. Because that what it does is it already worsens the plight of many citizens. I give the last word to you, Professor Peter Corte. It appears it's going to be a highly anticipated budget. Should we measure our anticipation and expectations of this budget? Should we be a bit tempered? I think we should, because um, given where we find ourselves, we are not in normal times, and therefore um, some kind of uh, surprises may be okay. Um, there is a need to show up revenue, and I, I would imagine that increasing some taxes in, in marginally might might okay. Um, but uh, just just to point out, like um, when I was at Tekke mentioned, I think our VAT rate is not twelve. Uh, the standard rate is twelve point five, but there are other levies that have been added already. So if we want to increase it. Then it ought to be marginal, and also we need to make other tax handles more efficient. E levy cannot stay at 1.5%. It is unacceptable. It ought to come down to maybe 0.5%. We can raise more money through that angle. We can raise more money through property rates, etc. So let's let's look at other areas rather than lumping everything into one tax uh, uh, handle, which might not augur well for the business sector and for Ghanaians. And the size of government I mentioned is very critical. We mm. have to see a strong signal from government that is going to reduce the size of government before any marginal or tax increment can be accepted by, by all of us. Thank you. I'm grateful to you, gentlemen, and Professor Peter Corte, Sector Pe, and also to you, Dr. Toa Champon, especially those of us who join us from the US and the UK for having time to be part of this broader conversation. We all await what happens tomorrow in the all anticipated budget that will announce an IMF program. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining today's Upfront.
Pleasure.